Now, the reason we're having this briefing is because in early October, the Jason 3 satellite will take over from Jason 2 as the reference mission for global sea surface height measurements. And it will be carrying on a time series that's been going on now for over 23 years. It's an incredibly important satellite. And in the next half hour, we want to tell the story of why Jason 3 is so important. And to do this, we've gathered speakers from all the partners involved in the JSON program. So to do some introductions, on my far left, we have um, Richard Gilmore from the European Commission's DG Grow Copernicus unit. Hello, Neil. Hello. Good afternoon to the audience, both here in Darmstadt and following us on the internet. And next to me, I have uh, Francois Parizeau, who's uh, Jason 3 project manager at UMETSA. Thank you, Neil. Good afternoon, everybody. And on my right, I have Philippe Escudier, who's the oceanography program manager at the French space agency CNES. Thank you, Neil, and good afternoon. And on my far right, I have Pierre-Yves Letrain, from the, he's science director at Mercator Ocean. Thank you, Neil, and good afternoon to all of you. Okay. And we will also have, dialing in remotely, we will have Laurie Miller, who's the Jason 3 program scientist at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the US. And we'll also have a recorded presentation from Joss Willis from uh, NASA JPL. He's the Jason 3 project scientist. And the format for this briefing is that we'll have six short presentations and then after that, we'll open the floor up to questions from the audience and then also over Twitter. And we'd like people to use the, the hashtag AskJason3. So if we start with the first presentation, um, our first speaker is Richard Gilmore. Um, and he's going to be talking about why the Jason 3 satellite is so important for the European Union's Copernicus Earth Observation Programme. Thank you, Neil, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank the hosts, UMETSAT, for giving the European uh, Commission the opportunity to speak at this JSON 3 briefing event. As you already said, Neil, in my short introduction, I hope to explain why JSON 3 is so important for Europe, and in particular, for Europe's Earth Observation Program, Copernicus. I know the other presenters will focus on the technical specifics of JSON 3 so my presentation will describe, in broad terms, the Copernicus program and where altimetry and JSON-3 fits in with this. Now, some have described Copernicus as the most ambitious Earth observation program to date. It is a seven-year program running from 2014 to 2021 with an overall budget of 4.3 million euro. It involves the building, launch, and operation of close to 20 Earth observation satellites, and the processing of the extensive data produced by these satellites into information that is useful for decision makers. It is a comprehensive system for monitoring the state of the environment, and it took almost two decades of European investment and sustained research and development activities to make the Copernicus program become an operational re reality with sustained European funding. It is a truly European endeavor built on a pooling of European resources, but it is also a truly global endeavor in that it covers the entire globe and also builds on the contributions beyond Europe. We can schematically divide Copernicus into two main components, the space component and the service component. So let's start by looking at the space component of Copernicus. Although Copernicus is building its own dedicated space infrastructure, and more about that in just a moment, in the first stages, it will rely on numerous existing European and international space assets, the so-called contributing missions, which you can see on this slide. 
There are currently some 14 missions that contribute to the Copernicus program, for the most part European missions. Jason 3 fits into this landscape of contributing missions and is one of two altimetry missions along with Cryosat. But I would say that Jason 3 can be considered to be something of a special case, and this for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is the only mission based on international cooperation between Europe and the US, in particular between the main stakeholders, UMETSAT, CNES, NOAA, and NASA. A sign, I would say, of the global importance of altimetry. Furthermore, it is the only contributing mission to receive Copernicus funding for part of the satellite's operations, a further indication of how important Jason 3 is to Copernicus. Another important aspect is that Jason 3 is part of a long-term project to ensure continuity up to 2030. And last but not least, as the reference mission, it is considered to be the European back backbone sorry, of an altimeter constellation. For all these reasons, Jason 3 can be considered to be of central importance to the Copernicus program. But as I just said, Copernicus is also building its own dedicated satellites, the Sentinels. You can see in the slide the schedule for almost 20 satellites to be launched over a period of 13 years, ensuring continuity of observations through to 2030. There are six main families of Sentinels based on a wide range of sensing technologies to serve different Earth observation needs. So far, four satellites have been successfully launched. 1A, 2A, 3A, and more recently, 1B. In the context of today's briefing on JSON-3, I would like to focus on two Sentinel families, and you can see in the slide that I have highlighted these with the red rectangle. Firstly, Sentinel-3 is of particular interest. It is the first Sentinel to include an ocean topography mission with radar altimetry. It will directly rely on JSON-3 to calibrate its measurements. Secondly, I would like to draw your attention to Sentinel-6, a high-precision radar altimetry mission. In fact, Sentinel-6 is the name given to JSON-CS in the context of the Copernicus program. Jason CS, or Sentinel 6A, is the reference altimetry mission foreseen to take over from Jason 3 around 2020. We can see from these first two slides, rather, what we can see from these first two slides is that the Jason program will actually become an integral part of the Copernicus program. The short term aim is to have a constellation of two Sentinel radar altimeters and a Sentinel reference mission to calibrate these. Now we've seen in broad terms the space component of the Copernic Copernicus program and why JSON-3 is a central element to this. I'd like to complete the picture by saying a few words about the Copernicus services and again understand why JSON-3 is important. Now we might consider the space component and the Sentinels to be the eyes and ears of the Copernicus program, looking down at the Earth and gathering all kinds of information about the environment. If that is the case, then we can consider the services to be the brain of the program, effectively transforming the huge quantities of data from the space component into information that we can actually use information that allows us to understand the environment and take decisions. These services are structured into six main areas, covering all parts and all aspects of the Earth's environment. As far as JSON-3 is concerned, its altimetry measurements are of specific importance to the marine service, as the measurement of the height of the sea surface is an essential input parameter. 
I'd like to brief, therefore briefly describe the Marine Service and the information that it provides. The Marine Service provides information and forecasts on the state of the ocean, including physical aspects such as ocean currents, sea temperature, sea ice cover, sea level and salinity, but also other aspects such as biochemistry. It covers the entire globe and also offers more precise and tailored information for five European regional seas. It provides information that can be useful for a whole range of maritime activities. Just to give one example, that of shipping, where, for example, uh, ships could use the information from the marine service to plan the most efficient routes as a function of the currents. One of the most important inputs from Earth observation is the measurement of sea height, which is essential for ensuring the accuracy of the forecasts. JSON 3 directly contributes to the quality and the accuracy of the Copernicus Marine Service forecasts by providing high precision altimetry measurement. It further contributes by calibrating other alt altimetry measurements from other satellites, such as JSON-2, Cryosat-2, and of course Sentinel-3A, but also other international missions such as HY-2A and Altica. So to conclude, I hope that I've been in successful in explaining why JSON-3 is so important for the Copernicus program. In short, I think that we can say that JSON-3 is an essential part of the ocean forecasting part of Copernicus. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks Richard, that's great. Um, so now we're going to move on to Francois Parizeau, who's going to talk to us about what happens when JSON-3 takes over from JSON-2, and also about what happens after JSON-3 comes to the end of its working life. Uh, thank you, Neil. So let me first explain you a bit what, why we are here today and uh, what will happen with our two satellites, JSON-2 and JSON-3, in the, in the coming weeks. So. Uh, JSON-3 was launched on the uh, 17th of January 2016, and a few weeks uh, after its launch, it was placed, as you can see on this slide, uh, on the same exact orbit at an altitude of 1,336 kilometers, close, very close to JSON-2. The distance between the two satellites is about 500 kilometers, representing only 80 seconds of time difference. So why do we do this? In 80 seconds, the ocean has not moved, nothing has changed in the ocean, and almost nothing has changed in the atmosphere. So this configuration allows to cross-calibrate very precisely and directly both uh, systems. Check that the performance, that the new satellites are at least as good as those of its uh, predecessor. This takes a bit of time because you have to Remember that we want to measure the sea elevation with an accuracy of a few centimeters, again from an orbit of 1,336 kilometers. So you must recognize that it requires to accumulate a number of measurements and to look at all instrument and satellite performances to do this precise cross calibration. So it has taken, as expected, a bit more than six months to perform this activity. Now, we have demonstrated that the JSON-3 performance are excellent, and it's now time for JSON-3 to take over from the old JSON-2. I say old because JSON-2 was launched in 2008, so has now accumulated more than eight years of excellent service, significantly exceeding uh, its nominal lifetime. But despite his age, JSON-2 is still in very good shape and ready to continue to deliver high accuracy sea topographic data. So in order to take advantage of uh, uh, this situation to a brand new JSON-3 satellite and a still healthy JSON-2, we have entered into discussion with our users uh, to see how best we can benefit from the two satellites. And the result of this discussion is that JSON-2 will be moved, as you will see on this, uh, still being on the same orbit, but making ocean observation at different time and place than JSON-2. 
thus improving the overall coverage. This move necessitates a number of maneuvers using the propulsion system of the satellite. It will start on the 2nd of October and be completed by the 14th of October. At this time, and as illustrated uh, here, instead of one single satellite track or measurement pass, we will have two tracks, the second one being exactly in the middle of the first one. This configuration allows a better and more accurate detection of sea states, particularly in the area of high dynamics, such as the Gulf Stream, as you can see on these slides. Eddy's locations and intensity are much better depicted with this new configuration. As was said before, the JSON satellites are not the only altimetry satellite today flying. We also have Sentinel-3, launched in February 2016. Sentinel-3 is also flying on a different orbit, and again, as illustrated here, the two satellites ground track are different and complementary, allowing to maximize the, the coverage. Both missions are now operated here at UMEDSAT under the Copernicus umbrella and delivering key inputs, data feeding the marine environmental services. In 2017, Sentinel-B will join this fleet of altimetry mission. This allows to fulfill the uh, user requirements that have expressed the need of one reference complemented by three complementary altimetry missions so as to get the adequate sampling of the ocean. As you will see in the presentation to come, almost 25 years of uninterrupted flow have now been accumulated. But 25 years is nothing when we address uh, climate changes. So the crucial point now is to ensure continuity of service. And as I said before, this is the main objective of JSON-CS or Sentinel-6, the next reference altimetry mission, which is developed jointly by UMEDSAT, ISA, NASA, and NOAA, with the support of CNES. The Sentinel-6 mission is implemented through two satellites, the first one being launched in 2020, the second one in 2025. And this will ensure the continuation of this, again, uninterrupted data flow up until 2030, or hopefully later on. Thank you for your attention. OK, thanks, Francois. Uh, now we're going to look at the history of the uh, JSON satellites with Philip Escudier. Thank you, Nate. Um, the first thing I, I would like to, to address is to come back on this uh, very essential role that, that uh, altimetry is playing in ocean monitoring. Uh, this this uh, role is related to the fact that any change in, uh, in the uh, physics of the ocean uh, uh, change the elevation in the water. Uh, if you take an example, if it is stored in the ocean, uh, it changes the temperature, and then uh, through di dilatation, the density of the water is changing, and then uh, the elevation of the water is, is going up, is increasing. Uh, if, uh, on uh, other topic, if currents uh, are flowing in the ocean, it, it impacts the, the surface of the, of the water due to the equilibrium of forces within, within the ocean. So that any, uh, any current uh, in the ocean will, will look like a slope on the ocean. And this is what is de depicted on this, uh, on this figure, which shows uh, the status of the ocean at the beginning of the first mission of this series of uh, reference altimetry mission. It was Topex Poseidon, launched in 1992. And uh, several weeks after, after the launch, we could get this picture, which shows the low and high of the ocean topography, and which can be read as uh, the, the uh, uh, figure of the uh, currents, uh, large currents in the ocean. Actually, uh, currents are flowing around the low and high of the ocean topography exactly the same way winds are blowing around the low and high of the atmospheric uh, uh, pressure. So this is an equivalent for oceanography of the well-known uh, role of uh, barometric pressure for, for meteorology. Uh, so from this short presentation, you can see that it's really important because either at surface or at depth, any change in the physics of the ocean uh, uh, can be measured through this integrated information uh, provided by the altimetric uh, measurement. Uh, uh, as it was already said, uh, 
an important point for this measurement is the accuracy of the measurement, because all those signals, uh, change in temperature, uh, currents, etc., turns into a signal which amplitude, in average, is about 10 centimeters. So to provide valuable information, we need to measure, measure the, uh, the altimetry, the elevation of the surface, with an accuracy which is better than 10 centimeters. And to do that, we need to combine a set of uh, information to get the adequate, uh, adequate measurements. Uh, there are more than 50 different steps in the computation of the, of the surface elevation. To illustrate this, uh, the criticality of this issue, uh, the, the, this chart shows the progress that have been made that were necessary to reach this accuracy in one of those steps, which is the computation of the altitude of the satellite, which is the first step of this computation. Before the time of this uh, beginning of this reference uh, altimetry mission, what we, we could do at this time was to compute an, uh, an, orbit, an orbit with an accuracy that was uh, um, uh, was not reaching the mature accuracy. And it's only with this top ex Poseidon uh, mission that the accuracy of this orbit computation was, uh, was better than, than 10 centimeters. And you can see on this chart that after, uh, thanks to research and development effort, both on the instrument and the, on the uh, computation, now we are at a level of accuracy consistent with our uh, mission objective. And this is one example of the multiple uh, com computation and, uh, uh, that needs to be made to, to get this uh, uh, altimetric information. Um, in parallel with this accuracy issue, a second one, which already was, uh, was uh, uh, addressed, is the fact that uh, due to the turbulent nature of the ocean, uh, we need a good coverage both in sp space and, and in time. We need to revisit the global Earth every 10 days or so and to get a uh, um, resolution which is compatible with the size of the EDs we want to monitor. And for that, as Francois mentioned, we need, we need four satellites. So this, this was demonstrated at the beginning of this new era of altimetry by combining Topex Poseidon information with ERS uh, information. And then uh, this concept has developed and now we have set up a requirement for a virtual altimetry constellation, which is now uh, fully in place with uh, JSON-3 complementing uh, Sentinel-3 uh, Sentinel uh, information. And uh, beyond uh, this, uh, this constellation, which is now uh, uh, the basis for uh, operational monitoring of the, of the ocean, we are now making research and development effort uh, to build of new uh, to build new generation of altimetry uh, instruments and satellites because uh, the the user demand which is already uh, satisfied with the present service uh, is asking us to 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 reach higher resolution higher resolution both, both in terms of special resolution and time resolution that's why we are working on new, on new uh, uh, in generation of of instruments that will be tested with the SWOT uh, demonstration mission, which will be in uh, 2020, and that will eventually uh, be useful to uh, define future Copernicus uh, uh, step of the, of the program uh, beyond uh, two, uh, 2020. And this will be uh, discussed later. So, thank you for... Okay, for thanks, Philippe. Uh, now we'll go to Pierre-Yves, who's going to tell us a bit more about how JSON-3 data are used in the Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Service. Thank you. Up. Okay, so I will now turn to the, the use and the role of uh, JSON-3 for the Copernicus Marine Service. So the Copernicus Marine Service is one of the six services uh, as part of the Copernicus uh, program, as presented by uh, Richard uh, at the start of this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, it is implemented by Mercator Ocean under a delegation agreement with, uh, with the European Union. So the Copernicus Marine Service is a major undertaking at EU level to provide an operational marine service. It's really building 
or more than 10 years on research and development at European level, in particular through the MyOcean uh, project. So it is operational, it's scientifically assessed, uh, it's covering both observations, so satellite, in situ, and models, and models are mandatory if you want to provide forecast of the state of the ocean. So models are used to provide reanalysis over the last 30 years, analysis and forecast. We are covering physics, so sea level, currents, temperature, salinity, sea ice, and also biogeochemistry. We are working with a network of uh, European producers, which are uh, coordinated by, uh, by Mercator Ocean. So we have more than 50 marine centers all around uh, Europe that are contributing to this operational system. Uh, we have a unique catalogue. We have covering both the global ocean on all European regional seas, and uh, we have a central information system to provide access to the different data. On a, uh, a major importance is also the service desk that we are running, which is used to support users on, uh, uh, for accessing uh, all the data sets. So the service is generic, we, we call it a core service, and really the initial idea is that we need to have this core information on the ocean, which is available, readily available, open and free, and then you could develop, I mean, operational uh, downstream application and have a network of users. And this initial, initial idea uh, actually was, uh, uh, the realization was quite a success because as of today, we have more than 7,000 uh, users or subscribers of the, of the service that are using our products to uh, a wide range of application. We are actually covering four main uh, areas of benefits and we are actually monitoring our users for the different areas of benefits. So they range for the coastal and marine environment, the uh, marine resources, uh, weather, uh, seasonal forecasting and climate and maritime safety. So the role of the JSON-3 for the Copernicus Marine Service is uh, fundamental. And this is uh, actually related to the fact that altimetry is uh, unique and fundamental uh, for ocean analysis and forecasting. Uh, as was already explained, so sea level as measured by altimetry uh, is an uh, indirect measure of ocean current, but is also representative of the interior of the ocean, the density anomaly at the interior of the ocean. And this is the reason why it has really a huge impact uh, for assimilating into ocean model to provide a full description of the ocean state on, uh, on forecasting. In addition, it's also an all-weather and global uh, instrument, so that is really a, a huge impact for ocean analysis of forecasting. So JSON-3 is a reference mission. It's fundamental because it is used to intercalate all the other altimeter missions that, you, that we need. And it's also essential uh, to provide together with in-situ data uh, uh, ocean, the ocean monitoring, uh, ocean climate monitoring that the Copernicus Marine Service is providing. For instance, monitoring these large climatic uh, events such as uh, La Nino, El Nina, uh, the mean sea level rise and so on. This is part of the, of the activity of the Copernicus Marine Service. But many of our applications uh, require a high resolution description and forecast of the ocean state. We are, for instance, uh, uh, dealing with applications such as uh, uh, um, prediction of the fate of marine pollution, uh, ship routing, search and, search and rescue, uh, supporting the offshore industry, and all these applications that require a high resolution description of ocean current and forecast. And for this, you need several altimeters. We need at least four altimeters, and JSON-3 needs to be complemented by other altimetry, altimeter mission. And so there is really a, a critical importance on complementarity with Sentinel-3A and 3B from the Copernicus, but also the future uh, interleave tandem mission of JSON-2. So, our concluding word, I mean, first, I mean, uh, important to state here that JSON-3 is now fully integrated in the Copernicus Marine Service. So it's uh, no, uh, uh, it became uh, last week our reference mission. So it's part of our, our uh, observation products through the uh, uh, sea level thematic assembly center. And it's also already used in the global and regional modeling and forecasting centers. Uh, as uh, explained, uh, uh, since JSON, JSON-3 is essential for, uh, for uh, modeling and forecasting. We have a, a large proportion of the products that we provide today that are positively impacted by, by, by JSON-3. Actually, uh, almost 60% of our products uh, are impacted by JSON-3. 
There was a very smooth transition from JSON 2, so we were able to switch from JSON 2 to JSON 3 very smoothly. And that, uh, I mean, it's important here to thank uh, all the JSON 3 project team for their very hard work, making sure that JSON 3 and JSON 2 are fully consistent and then they can be really used for operational monitoring. Uh, Last point is, as we are dealing with users, I mean, users, they need to have uh, confidence that we will be able to, to provide a long-term service. So continuity is essential for us. And the fact that we have no decision to have this JSON-CS Sentinel-6 mission uh, to ensure continuity of these essential measurement is really a major step forward for us. On final words, that JSON-3 needs to be complemented by other altimeters. This is mandatory to describe and forecast ocean current at fine scale. We know that we need at least four altimeters. We know that we have even, even more uh, challenging tasks to describe at finer scale the, the ocean, and the SWOT mission will be uh, 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 the next uh, breakthrough in, uh, in, uh, in oceanography. But this is very important to have this complementarity of JSON-3 with the other altimeters. Thank you. OK, thanks, Pierre. Um, next, we're going to go to a recorded presentation from Joss Willis from NASA JPL. And he's going to be telling us a bit more about how JSON-3 data is used for climate monitoring. This is a really important occasion for JSON-3 because it's the handoff from JSON-2 to JSON-3 of our climate record. The global record of sea level rise has been measured since the time of Topex Poseidon starting in the early 1990s. It was handed off to Jason 1, followed by Jason 2, and now Jason 3. These missions measure globally average sea level rise, among a whole lot of other things. And that's important because the rising oceans are one of the most important indicators we have of human caused climate change. In this graphic, you can see the rise in carbon dioxide over the last 50 or so years. This is caused by the burning of fossil fuels and is the major driver of climate change today. On the right, you can see one of the most important impacts of this change, which is the rising oceans. This measurement, which goes back to the Topex Poseidon days, shows how sea levels have risen globally in the last 23 years. Almost eight centimeters of increase have been seen during this time, and all of that is due to the warming of the planet, the melting of the ice sheets and glaciers, and the thermal expansion of the oceans. Because the oceans absorb over 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases and collect the water of the melting glaciers and ice sheets, this represents one of our most powerful indicators of the footprint of human-caused climate change. As JSON-3 takes over the record of climate change from JSON-2, we mark this occasion with this press conference because it's a reminder that we have to continue to measure the planet's climate in the most accurate way possible. In the next graphic, we can see how sea level rise is one of the things that we really are not very good at predicting out into the future. Which path are we on? Are we looking at one or two feet of sea level rise in the next 100 years? Or are we looking at five to six feet, a devastating amount that would affect hundreds of millions of people across the planet? The Jason missions allow us to measure this very accurately and document how sea level rise is occurring and how fast we're looking at it happening today. Because of this, these missions are really one of our most important tools for monitoring the climate and its health. We look to these satellites in the future to continue measuring sea level rise out for another five or six years for Jason 3 until the launch of the Jason CS missions in 2020 and 2025. I'm Josh Willis. I'm sorry I couldn't be there but I'm really excited about Jason 3 and all the excellent data it's providing about the oceans and our changing climate. Okay, um, and now we're going to our last speaker, which is Laurie Miller uh, from NOAA over in the US, and he's gonna be joining us live uh, via Skype. Hi, I'm uh, 
Oops. Okay, can you hear us okay, Laurie? Yeah, I have to kill my uh, safari. <laughs> okay. okay, no feedback. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's too bad that Josh is someplace uh, in Greenland uh, helping measure uh, the changes in the uh, ice of Greenland. Uh, let me just bring to your attention a couple of what I think are important applications that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is using altimetry data for. And uh, I think this brings to light the fact that uh, Jason 3 and its predecessor missions have been incredibly versatile, not only for climate purposes, but also for near real time applications. And one example that I'd like to give you is the impact of altimetry on tracking oil spills. And I have an image uh, which shows the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which occurred a couple of years ago. And it shows the oil being spread uh, across uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And superimposed on that is an image of the currents of the ocean, which are determined uh, using a numerical model that is initialized with altimetry data. Uh, as Philippe uh, explained, uh, the currents of the ocean are uh, controlled by the surface pressure of the ocean, the highs and lows that the altimeter can map. This is uh, directly analogous to the way that meteorologists uh, are able to determine the winds in the atmosphere by knowing the atmospheric pressure, but here we're using the surface of the ocean to talk about the pressure of the ocean. And it's information like this that's really extraordinarily useful in a near real time application for making sure that the uh, oil spill is contained or uh, to give warning of it uh, spreading to land. Information like this is also used by NOAA and the US Coast Guard to help uh, devise search and rescue plans uh, if there's a disabled ship or if an airplane crashes and there are people in the water, we want to know where they're going to drift to. And the surface information, the sea level uh, uh, currents, uh, derived currents from the altimetry, uh, are used in, in, in a near real time uh, plan for uh, devising a, a search pattern. Now, another example which may surprise you is the application of uh, satellite altimetry in the Jason 3 measurements for the forecasting of hurricanes, one of the more, most difficult uh, meteorological forecasting problems. We do a pretty good job of uh, figuring out where hurricanes are going to go, but we have a lot of trouble uh, precisely identifying when a hurricane is going to intensify. And so, for example, the example of Katrina which hit uh, New Orleans and caused a lot of devastation there. And as it turned out that the uh, intensification of hurricanes is controlled in large measure by the heat content of the ocean. The hurricanes feed off of the heat energy in the ocean. And uh, the altimeter actually does a pretty good job of identifying those areas where there's a lot of extra heat because that's where the uh, surface of the ocean bulges up. And uh, Katrina is actually an excellent example where uh, the altimeter was able to identify a region that uh, helped amplify the intensity of, of the hurricane. And finally, I'd like to mention something that uh, probably has been mentioned in passing. We use uh, the altimetry data from Jason 3 to help uh, monitor and forecast the evolution of El Nino events, which uh, are shown here in a video. Uh, dramatizing the most recent El Nino, which uh, occurred as a very large uh, surface elevation spanning all the way from uh, the west coast of South America, practically across the ocean. Now, the altimeter sees this very clearly as an elevated area of sea level, and being able to track the evolution of El Nino events allows meteorologists to forecast uh, disturbances that will affect North American weather. The presence of an El Nino 
uh, often uh, disturbs the, the track of the jet stream, which in turn determines whether some areas of the U.S. are going to get more rainfall or less rainfall, and even uh, if there's going to be a drought in some areas. And uh, in, a, in some cases, we can even uh, tell when uh, tornadoes, which are actually very uh, difficult to forecast, uh, where the tracks of uh, tornadoes will be displaced. So these are three examples of what we at NOAA use the altimeter data from JSON-3 in near real time for forecasting purposes that are vital uh, in terms of protecting lives and property. And so it's for this reason that we're extremely excited by the fact that JSON-3 is now about to become the reference mission. So that's what I wanted to convey to you today. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Laura. That's brilliant. That should stimulate a lot of questions as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, okay, now we've come to the end of the presentation. So what we'd like to do is take a couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll have a look at the questions that have been coming in on Twitter. So does anyone have any questions here? Thank you for the nice presentation. It's a question, actually, I'm not sure to whom of the speaker I have to ask this question. It's about of the applications uh, to the, of the, this altimetry, JSON, and in general, altimetry satellites. A lot of applications were mentioned, but uh, what about tsunamis, uh, especially uh, the tsunami we had a few years ago uh, in Japan? Uh, my question is how these altimetry satellites are able to analyze data from the tsunamis and maybe to warn also a population. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who'd like to take that one with that? Or maybe I can, yeah. I, I can answer on, on this. I mean, uh, using altimetry to uh, predict a tsunami uh, is, not re is not possible because you need really a very uh, need to, uh, to observe the, the tsunami with very high space and time resolution. So it's not possible. You, you will need a, a huge number of altimeters. Still, uh, we can observe a tsunami with altimetry, and there were several, I mean, very nice studies showing uh, the observation of the tsunami because we had, by chance, a track was cross crossing the tsunami. So we can get information on the structure of the tsunami when it is uh, uh, at sea, but it's more offline analysis and so on. But prediction of the tsunami with altimetry, it's not something which is possible. Okay. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask the panel? No? Ah, okay. How many users did you have for JSON-3? I think this was yeah. already mentioned, for instance, for the... Uh, so we have the user as part of the Copernicus Marine Service, so that user of all the products that we have. As I explained, many of these pro products are dependent on JSON-3, but not only, we are because we are also providing a, uh, satellite observation of uh, sea surface temperature and model and so on. But today, with, uh, as part of the Copernicus Marine Service, we have uh, more than 7,500 uh, 7, uh, subscribers, uh, which are the people who are connected to our, our system. And every year, more than uh, 4,000 uh, users that connect to our system and download data. So this is, uh, and this is really uh, increasing uh, uh, year after year. So this is really the sign that what I explained that the initial idea that we have to provide open and, and free uh, data for the ocean uh, and then to, uh, that we help the development of application is actually a, a success. Okay, um, so maybe now if we move over to our uh, Twitter questions, um, I think we should be able to see what's been coming in on the screen down here. Okay, so we have the first question is from uh, Peter de Selding. Um, hi, Peter. Um, is there any way of estimating the remaining useful life of JSON 2? Maybe. Um, thanks for the, for the question. So first, I, I want to say that uh, JSON 2, as I mentioned, is still very healthy. So uh, uh, we have not had any significant failure of JSON 2. So we are still on the, uh, on the primary uh, chain, you know that most most of the elements of the satellite are redundant, and we are on the primary chain for uh, for all elements. 
So uh, we have reserved of uh, fuels on board the satellite, so uh, uh, we can hope that uh, JSON 2 will last uh, as long as its predecessor, JSON 1, which uh, reached uh, a lifetime of uh, 11 years, if, uh, if I'm correct. So uh, we all cross our fingers to, to get the same uh, lifetime for JSON 2. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look at the, the next question then. Ah, okay, so we have a question from uh, Dr. Mark Higgins, um, and he's saying he gets asked a lot, why uh, do we have multiple satellites measuring sea surface height, and how is it possible to measure the seafloor with altimeters? So who would like to take that on? Okay, I can start at least for the first part. Uh, As I explained, I mean, we need multiple satellites uh, to measure the sea level variations. It's simply because the ocean is a really a turbulent system, so it's full of uh, meanders, eddies, filaments, so a uh, current like the Gulf Stream is not at all a quiet river, so it has a very small, such small scale uh, feature, so typically at the level of 100 kilometers. So if you want to observe these, uh, uh, these signals, those eddies, uh, which are very important for many applications, you need to have several altimeters, at least four. I mean, that's why what, what we uh, request to have a, a, a sufficiently accurate representation of the uh, of sea level and ocean current and also to be able to predict them. Uh, hmm? Okay, so second wise is on the seafloor, so it's totally different topic, but uh, uh, it's going back to the uh, principle of, the, of uh, 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 altimetry measurement. So the main measure of the altimetry is the sum of the geoid, which is the equipotential of the Earth's gravity field on the uh, sea level or dynamic topography, which is a signal of interest for oceanographers. If you look at the level of the, of, the, of the geoid, at small scale, the geoid reflects the variation of mass in the interior of the ocean, so it can be used to derive ocean bathymetry. This is the reason why when you have, uh, again, sufficient altimeter at fine scale, you can get, get uh, very useful uh, information on, uh, on seafloor and bathymetry. Okay, can we take the next question then? Okay, so Tim Hewson's asked, to understand the importance of continuity, how could a gap in the time series of ocean altimetry be handled? Who would like to take that Maybe one? Yeah, I can yep. try first. Uh, I think that uh, the, the main impact, major impact, is an accuracy of the series of, of, uh, of, uh, of data. Uh, if, uh, if, if we have a gap, it will be much more difficult to intercalibrate Uh, the measurements provided by the new satellite with respect to the to the uh, previous one. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the difficulty will be will be uh, intercalibration, and we will have then to rely on in situ data uh, to to make this intercalibration, which may be not at the level of accuracy that we can do presently by overflying JSON 2 and JSON 3 on the at making measurements at the same time, same same place, which mm -hmm. allow very precise intercalibration. Okay. Um, can we take another question then? Okay, so we have another question from Peter de Selding. You've explained JSON 3 and Sentinel continuity to 2030, but does this get you to four altimeters to that time or just three? Okay. Who would like to respond on that one? Yes, actually, this is, uh, those are the, uh, mainly the European contribution, plus, of course, the, 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 co the, the coordination with, uh, with the US. But in practice, we are relaying, as was explained by, by Philippe, on a virtual constellation. So it's not only this component, but we have also other missions. For instance, today, we are using uh, uh, a Chinese satellite, HY2. We are using Altica, which is a SARAL uh, 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 CNES India uh, corporation. So that's the whole idea of this uh, virtual constellation, where we are gathering all the different inputs from different agencies. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Viju John. Um, how does information about sea level improve weather forecasting? So who would like to take that? Ah, Pat, is Laurie still on the line? No? Okay, well, okay. One, perhaps a few times. I can try this because yep. this is really something on weather forecasting. Uh, one example was given by Laurie on a 
on this uh, hurricane forecasting. And uh, thanks, uh, uh, you need to have uh, information, through information of sea level, you have information of the heat content of the ocean, which is uh, an important mechanism to feed the hurricane. So if you can measure the sea level from altimetry, you can improve uh, uh, the forecast of the year of an important weather event, which is uh, hurricanes. Mm -hmm. But of course, then for the whole weather forecasting is one element among uh, many others, but it's an uh, uh, important uh, observing system. I think maybe to, com yeah, and maybe to, 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 to complement this, uh, this answer, we, we may address at this time uh, one point which we, we, we did not address before, which is that in addition to the uh, sea surface yes. topography, mm -hmm. uh, altimeters allow to, uh, to make measurements of uh, uh, significant wa wave height. Mm -hmm. So we are also measuring waves. Which, which is a parameter which is part, which is at the interface between weather forecasting and, and ocean. But we are providing to the, uh, to the uh, weather forecasting centers uh, measurements of uh, waves which are used for their forecast of waves. Okay. Globally speaking, mm -hmm. I would say that now also as, as, as uh, Pierre-Yves indicated, so altimetry help uh, building ocean models and now people are coupling the ocean model together with the atmospheric model, so as to improve the weather forecast on mid to, lo to long term, giving trends on the weather forecast uh, by coupling ocean and atmospheric uh, models. Okay. Um, okay, we have a question in from Marco Trovatello. Um, will Jason 3 help achieve the goals of COP21? <laughs> so who would like to take that one? It's, it's, I mean, the, the goals of, of, of COP21 depends a bit what are the goals of COP21. What we do with, with altimetry is make measurements. Uh, so we, we as, as was explained by, by Josh, uh, uh, the, the increase of mean sea level rise is, is again a key indicator of the global, of the global warming. So we, what we can do, I would say, is providing some evidence of this, of this uh, uh, climate warming through the uh, sea uh, level rise. And quantitative, and quantitative it. evolution of, of this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ryan Led has a question. Um, to what order of magnitude um, can you measure the rise in sea level? How much can you relate to global warming and change of sea surface temperature? For, for the order of magnitude of the, of the accuracy, uh, well, it depends on uh, how, how you, you can do averages on, on elementary measurements. The basic measurements provided by, by JSON-3 is, is provided uh, every second, which turns to be every six kilometers over the years. Mm -hmm. And these basic measurements has an accuracy of about three to four centimeters. So this is the elementary measurements. But when, when you are uh, interested by the mean sea level rise, you can make averages of all these elementary measurements over 10 days, which is a repeat cycle of JSON. And then uh, the level of accuracy you, ca you can get at the present time is half a millimeter per year. Mm -hmm. half a so okay. th this, but you, this, uh, you, you can imagine that this implies a lot of uh, uh, um, calibration and validation uh, to be sure that making those overages, you really down uh, the, the, uh, the accuracy level uh, down to that. But a lot of effort has been done, and now we can say that we are at the sub-millimeter levels for the mean sea level rise. Okay. Okay. And for second question? Well, maybe a short comment on how much can you relate to global warming and change of SST. This was, uh, I think, briefly uh, uh, presented by Joss, but uh, that's something we can measure with complementary measurement. We have, from, for instance, this is also part of the data that we deliver through the Copernicus Marine Service, the Argo Global Array of Profiling Flows that measure temperature variation of the ocean. So we can quantify the part of sea level change which is due to the uh, uh, heating of the ocean, so uh, the dilatation of the ocean. And today, it's uh, uh, slightly more, more than one third of this expansion, which is due to expansion. And the remaining, remaining part of the uh, sea level rise is due to the melting of uh, ice sheet. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, SciTech, DW SciTech. How will the Jason 3 satellite give us more data on the Earth's sea levels? Um, we've kind of covered in a way. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think we have already covered uh, that one. No? Do we have another? Okay. 
Okay, so we have another question. Um, why does the radar altimeter use pulses at 13.6 gigahertz in the KU band and 5.3 in the C band to measure distance to C? Maybe that's for you, Philippe. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's directly related to this uh, issue of uh, accuracy of the measurements. Uh, the, the, the radar which is used uh, for, for the information, travel, the signal travels through the, the atmosphere, and atmosphere interacts with the signal, and this is a perturbation that we have to take into account to get the adequate uh, level of accuracy. And uh, one of these uh, perturbations is due to the ionosphere, which is the upper atmosphere effect, and to uh, quantify this effect, we, we, we use these double frequency measurements, which allow us to uh, quantify this effect and correct it in the measurements that we deliver to the users, final users. Okay, okay. We have um, a question from uh, Tim Hewson. We saw the increase in sea level is uneven. Where is the greatest increase and the lowest? And do we know why? So who would like to take that one? Okay, Maybe you can, or, yeah. Yes, we, we know. I mean, if, um, and that's the great value of uh, altimetry is not only to, uh, uh, to give a, a global mean of, uh, a global estimate of mean sea level variation, but we can look at the regional details. And when you use the data together with models, as we do in, uh, in the Copernicus Marine Service, you really have the under understanding of why you have all these differences. And if you look at, uh, at a map, and to have an, uh, to give a, it's difficult to give a simple answer to this, this question because first it depends on, on time. If you look at an average over 10 years, 20 years or 30 years, it would not be the same. But what you see is, is simply the uh, change in repartition of mass uh, uh, of the, uh, in the ocean due to the ocean circulation on wind. So this is well understood. And if you look at the local effect, it can be maybe time, 10 times more than the, the uh, uh, the global average, but it will vary uh, over time. So this is really due to the internal dynamics of the ocean, but one of the great value of uh, altimetry together with the complementary measurement is to map these variations. Okay. Um, all right, well, I think we've got time okay. for one more question on Twitter. So uh, this is from uh, Phil Nolan. Can you quantify the contribution of JSON satellites to weather forecast accuracy? Who would like to take this one? I think um, we already answered. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a bit difficult, I yeah. think, maybe to to quantify today the contribution of JSON satellite to weather forecast accuracy. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, through the coupling of uh, of uh, ocean and atmospheric model, it's help improving the uh, what we call the monthly uh, weather forecast or the seasonal weather forecast. So. Uh, trying to identify whether next summer or ne next winter will be colder or, 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 or will be rainy or, or, or not. But it, it's a bit difficult to quantify it into the, I would say, a number of accurate days of, uh, of, uh, of, of forecast. It, this mm -hmm. is the, the objectives uh, with, with, with altimetry, I, except the, uh, the point mentioned by Philippe related to uh, uh, the measurement of wave heights and, and, mm -hmm. and things like that, but the objective of, of coupling this uh, ocean and, and uh, atmospheric model is, is rather to, to improve the uh, uh, the mid-term to long-term yeah. weather forecast. On okay. uh, Jason 3, sorry, mm. on Jason 3 is an ocean mission. So we, on, on we know, uh, we, we, we can quantify the large impact it has on ocean forecast accuracy. Yeah. You know that we, today, without any altimeter system, we cannot forecast ocean current, that's it. And we know very much uh, uh, how much uh, altimeters are needed to improve the forecast and so on, but this is a forecast of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I see that Maybe an example to illustrate, not, not quantify, but to illustrate this, uh, is the El Nino uh, forecast. It's, mm. it's clear that using altimetry uh, really mm. improves our capacity mm. to forecast uh, several months in advance big, uh, big events such as the El Nino. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, um, I think we've uh, come to the end of our time now for this briefing. So. Um, I apologise if we didn't get to all the questions that uh, people had in on Twitter, but um, we've come to the end. Um, we'll actually be putting this briefing on YouTube uh, later in the week, so if you missed any of it, you'll be able to watch it on there later. Um, also, one thing I wanted to mention is if, if, you have, um, if this has got, gained your interest 
in uh, ocean monitoring from space. We are actually organising uh, a massive open online course monitoring the oceans from space, and that will start on October the 24th. And it will be, you can find out more details about it from, the, uh, from our website. And so all it remains to say really is to thank you to all our speakers and, and thank you everyone for being here for the audience and also thank everyone who's been watching this online and have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you.